Joshua chapter number 1. Just going to read one verse. This verse God put on my heart. We're going to read verse number 8. I will qualify this by saying, like many verses or many uh, thoughts in the Bible, uh, a lot of charismatics have taken this verse and they have bastardized it and they have twisted it and they have tickled ears with it that they themselves might gain from it. Uh, can I say the Bible has never been pinned down for an individual to get any gain or glory to himself. The Bible was given that we might know the will of God and the word of God that he might get glory from our lives when we are obedient to the things of God. There are some wonderful promises in the scriptures that if we uh, uh, do them by faith and obedience, uh, that God will get glory, we will benefit and be blessed in doing so. But if we reject and become disobedient, that always brings judgment. Joshua chapter 1, verse number 8, the Bible says this, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. Thank you for being good to us. Thank you for always standing by us. Now, Father, as we come to you this morning, we realize under the sound of our voice there are many folks who have faced many things this week and throughout this year. There are folks who are standing in need of hearing from God. There are folks who are standing in need of help from God. There are folks who are standing in need of healing from God. And there are also folks that are standing in need for hope from God. And God, we realize you said without you we can do nothing. And Father, I realize in my own conceit, in my own uh, uh, abilities, in my own uh, consciousness, in my own uh, education, Lord, uh, 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 anything I say without your touch is just sounding brass and tinkling cymbals. So God, I pray that you would show up in a magnificent way through the preaching of the Word of God. Speak to hearts, certainly edify your people, instruct them, enlighten them, encourage them in the good things of God. I pray for any that may be amongst us today who are unsaved. They do not know the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that God, through cords of love, the sweet Holy Ghost of God, would draw them to you, that God, we might see them born again, even this very day. Now, Father, use this unworthy vessel, speak to hearts, and Father, we'll thank you for what you do, for it's in the lovely, wonderful, and holy name of the Lord Jesus we ask these things. Amen. Amen. To set the stage for what is transpiring, Moses has brought the children of Israel as far as he can. For 40 years, he has led them in the wilderness. He has been their voice from God. He has been their instructor. He has been their leader. He has been their shepherd. Uh, but because of an act uh, uh, done through frustration, he is not going to be permitted to cross over the river Jordan and go into the promised land. And God has uh, uh, taken Moses. He is now uh, uh, passed away. And Joshua has been appointed the next leader of Israel. Now, one of the things that Moses is greatly remembered for is God gave Moses the law. And now we find Joshua is here on the scene and God uh, uh, makes Joshua a promise. Uh, as long as the word of God is what directs Joshua, Joshua will be successful. Now I want to draw your attention to this verse. I want you to notice first of all the appetite that Joshua was to have and that we as believers are to have. You see, Joshua in the Old Testament is what Ephesians is to the local church in the New Testament. Now notice, if you will, uh, Joshua is to have an appetite for something. We find in verse number 8, This book of the law shall, shall not depart out of thy mouth. And what God is saying is you are to uh, partake of it. David goes on to say, Thy word have I hid in my heart uh, that I might not sin against thee. Uh, but Joshua is to never lose sight of it. He is to proclaim uh, the word of God to God's people. 
And can I say, you and I as believers today, uh, if we are to be what God would have us to be, if we are to make an impact in this world, uh, if we are to overcome every obstacle and every turn and every bend of our life, uh, uh, we must do it through and by uh, the final, the absolute and final authority of our lives, the Word of God. Uh, the Word of God is not just uh, uh, something we tote to church. The Word of God is not, it's not something we read uh, uh, when we need encouragement. Uh, uh, the Word of God uh, is the very will of God for our lives uh, when your life uh, is based on the word of God when you live your life walking through the pages of the word of God uh, when you are obedient to God uh, uh, friend you will face adversity in life but adversity will not overcome you because of what is in you Amen. the things of God uh, you show me a weak Christian I'll show you somebody who is void of the word of God you show me somebody that can go through some of the most traumatic things and still worship God, I will show you somebody that has based their life upon the precepts and principles of the Word of God. Amen. We see his appetite. I wonder this morning, how much do you eat from God's table? Amen. How much do you center your thoughts and your heart upon what thus saith the Lord? You can tell a whole lot about your strength and your spiritual condition based upon how much time you spend in God's book. Can I say not only we see an appetite, I want you to notice an attitude. Look what it says again in verse number 8. But thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Not only how much do you read God's word and partake of it, how much do you meditate on it? What is your attitude towards the Word of God? How much do you think about what God has said? Mm, mm. You see, I've preached this many times. Mm, your, your, your body is not saved. This old flesh is going back to the dust of the earth. But your mind is not saved as well. Your soul is saved. Uh, and the battle the devil always rages in our life is in our minds. Uh, and can I say the word of God has given uh, us direction that we're to think on those things that are lovely, those things of virtue, those things that are of good report. Uh, uh, the Bible tells us that if we trust in the Lord uh, and we think and depend upon him and, and, and meditate on him, uh, he'll direct our paths. He'll help us through this life. Uh, but it amazes me how much uh, junk we allow to go through our mind that has nothing to do with God. Amen. Years ago, and I'm talking about years ago, I'm talking about many years ago, Brian had hair years ago. Now, Brian was a little punk kid years ago. Uh, I got my first degree in computer programming. Now, that was a whole different day than today. Uh, we didn't have microprocessors, which are now called PCs, and they're even going by the wayside because everybody's got tablets. Mm, matter of fact, when the first time I sat down behind a PC, I said, this thing will never take off. It's too slow. Boy, did I miss the mark, huh? Should have invested in Google or something back then. But listen, one of the first things they taught us in programming and how to make that computer do what it's supposed to do is something called GIGO. G-I-G-O. Means if you put garbage in, garbage is coming out. You know what's wrong in a lot of Christians' lives? You put so much garbage into your mind, the only thing that comes out of your mind is out of your life is garbage. Hmm? If you'll meditate on the good things of God, and you'll uh, 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 think about the Lord, and you think about His kindness, and think about His long suffering, think about His word. Uh, 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 learn your verse a week, and just get that verse down, uh, and meditate on it, and see what it's saying. And God will speak to your heart. Uh, and friend, when you filter your mind with the things of God, you know what's going to come out of your life? The Lord. Amen. We see the appetite, we see the attitude, but notice the accordance. Again in this verse it says to meditate therein day and night. Why? That thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. You notice God didn't say do according to what you think you should do. He didn't say do according to what pleases you. He didn't say do according to what fits you. He said we're to eat of it, we're to and certainly make it a part of our lives uh, where to think on it uh, then we're to do it right. all of it Amen. if God says thou shalt then that means you do right. God said thou shalt not that means you don't do Amen. it's very simple right. just do what God says 
What's our one rule around here? Mind the Lord. What's that mean? That means if God says it, do it. Hmm? Just do what He says. If we all truly mind the Lord, what kind of church could we have? Huh? Hmm? We're to be in accord with God. How do we do that? Well, He's given us His Word, and then He's indwelled us with Himself through the Spirit of God. And if we do with the things He says to do, we'll be okay. Huh? We see the appetite, the attitude, and the accordance. Now notice the aftermath. If you make the Word of God a part of your life, if you think and meditate on the Word of God, and if through and by the grace of God you strive to do what God says, look what happens. He says this, Then, for then, He didn't say before then, He said for then. Not till then, you can't just read it and expect this to happen. You can't just meditate on it and expect this to happen. But God does the things in a trichotomy. He's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. And here he's given us a threefold uh, uh, rule. Uh, he said if you'll read and make the Word of God a part of your life uh, and it doesn't uh, uh, part from your mouth, uh, if you have an attitude where you meditate on it, uh, and then if you do it, if you do these things, for then... Thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Amen. Now I know that in our independent, fundamental, walk right, spit right, talk right, Baptist circles, many have been taught that we're to be doormats, that we're to be paupers, that we're to be meek and lowly, that were never to amount to anything. That's a bunch of hogwash. You know, Job was the wealthiest man in the East. Uh -huh. Do you know Abraham was wealthy? Yep. You know, many people in the Bible might not have had much as far as wealth, as far as the world's good, but they was wealthy towards God. Amen. Nowhere in the Bible does it teach us to educate our children to be paupers. It teaches us to educate our children in the ways of God and then let God work in their lives and let them become successful so they can give back to the Lord's local church. Amen. Can I say the Catholics have that down pat? They don't lose them once they've indoctrinated them, not money. But they teach them to go on and become successful and give back to the Catholic church. They'll lose their right arm before they'll not give back to their church. They may not even go to their church. They may not even go to confession, but they give back to it. And if not, the priest is going to show up at their door and ask where, their, where the contributions are. Hmm? But we teach our children, mm, just go get a job. You know what job means? Just over broke. And we teach our children, struggle all your lifetime and you'll be next to God. Hogwash. Can I say this? It is God's will and God's desire for His children to prosper and be successful. In Him, in the things of God, and in their lives. Now can I say, some person, they may be just as successful working a job as somebody that has a career. It's not based on your economical status. And the prosperity and success of God is not tied to economical status. But can I say, it's okay if God blesses you economically. Hmm? Amen. That's right. And I say, there are some people God doesn't bless to have a lot of money because He couldn't trust them with it. Yeah. Sure. Amen. Hmm? But I'm interested in this precept that is taught in this verse. Can I say that in God's desire for His children to be successful, He has designed a plan. Can I say, everyone that is created, God created them. But there are some who get adopted into His family. 
And it is the plan of God that every person who is born into this world, every person that takes breath, it is the plan of God for them to get born again and become part of his family. For it's his will that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And God's plan and God's design for success is people have to be saved. Folks that aren't saved, when it comes to God's economy, they don't ever make the measure they are ultimately unsuccessful because they're going to die and go to hell without God. It's God's plan for everyone to be saved, become part of His economy, and have a prosperous, successful life in this life and the life to come. God has a plan. Can I say this? His plan is salvation. Can I say God has a purpose? God's purpose for those that get saved uh, is that they will serve. His purpose is service. You've heard me say this. God doesn't save people just to take them to heaven. If that was the case, the moment you got saved, he'd take you to heaven. Uh, but God saved you uh, that you might serve him and be a light and be salt uh, to this dark, destitute world uh, that they might see how God uh, can take a drunk uh, or a harlot uh, or a dope, dope addict uh, or just a church member uh, and change their life uh, for his honor uh, and his glory. Uh, God didn't save us to sit on a pew. Uh, God saved us uh, to serve him in the local church uh, and to take uh, the glorious gospel of Christ uh, to a lost and dying world uh, that they too might be become a part of God's plan uh, that they too might have a successful prosperous life can I say if you do not fall in line with God's purpose and you do not serve him you will not be successful you will not be prosperous can I say God not only designed a plan salvation a purpose service but he also designed a path now we know there's only one way of salvation. Jesus said, I am the way, the, the life, the truth. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And can I say this, that mm, modern uh, Christianity is say there are many roads that lead to heaven. Hogwash, there's only one way. But can I say that the moment you got saved, God purposed you to serve him, but God also has a path for you in your life. He has certain avenues and certain steps that you're to take if you're going to become prosperous and successful. Hmm? Brother Watts is here. God called him to go to the capital. Hmm? Now can I say, it's one thing for somebody to say, I'm going to go up there and witness to our politicians. It's another thing to do it. You've got to have a, a, a working knowledge of how our government works. You've got to have a, a knowledge of the laws that are coming before our, our state government. You've got to have all kinds of uh, 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 those uh, 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 educational rights, but you also got to have a burden to go deal with those folks. That's the path God chose for him. There are other people God has chosen paths for. Your path may be to be a Sunday school teacher. Your path may be to be a, 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 a head of a visitation program. Your path may be uh, not to head anything, but to go out on visitation, knock on doors, pass out track. Your path uh, uh, may be to clean the church. Your path uh, uh, may be to be a light on your job. Uh, uh, but every one of us, uh, God has put us on a path. Uh, we have steps to take to get to where God wants us to be. And can I say I've been saved 45 years, been preaching this book 32 years. I've learned in 32 years of preaching I do not know everything I should know. Matter of fact, I, I can confidently say I do not know everything. Nobody does. Half of us not been told. But I can tell you this, the more I learn, the more I realize how much more I yet have to learn. Mm. It's all part of the steps God has for me. The doors he opens for me. I was thinking the other day. I mean, I'm nobody. But the doors he has opened for me. And the places he's allowed me to preach. I got a letter right here. Right here. In my Bible. A letter right here. This letter helps keep Brother Doug in check. This letter was written by a little girl 
in South Carolina. And this, this line, she says, you're one of my heroes. Who am I, Brother Doug? That little girl would say, that preacher right there, he's somebody I want to look up to. Sure. Uh, little teenage girl. Uh, she's born, they said she wouldn't live. She, she was born, she weighed a pound. Then they said she'd only be a vegetable. I've heard that little girl play piano and sing in church. That little girl loves God. And something possessed her to write a letter, tell this preacher I'm one of her heroes. Man, what a blessing. Who am I, Brother Josh, that God to open that door for me, go down there and preach at that place, and that little girl gain confidence in me? Who am I, Brother Sammy, get to come to St. Lucia, preach down there, and be around your folks, and then they meet us at the airport weeping because we got to come home? Who am I? That has, door's been opened to, but God had a path for me. He's got paths for you. He's got steps for you. He's got doors for you to go through for you to be successful. Then can I say this? He's designed, as we find in this verse, prosperity, success. Can I say that the Lord said he saw the travail or the success of the Lord Jesus Christ and he was pleased when he hung on the cross. The Lord looks at our lives and he is looking at how we walk through our steps to be pleased Second Chronicles 26, 5 says this, And he sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understandings in the visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. Again, we find prosper mentioned, but nowhere about gold and silver. It's about his walk with God and his light to this dark world. Matter of fact, 87 times in the Bible, we find the ideal or the characteristics of prosperity being referred to. Can I say this? Prosperity ought to be our desire Amen. that God would be pleased with our lives. Amen. How successful are you and how successful am I? See, that will be measured when we cross over and God says, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Amen. I have a preacher friend of mine. He's a brilliant man. Brother Andy Wells said this. Thinking about prosperity. Thinking about God being pleased with you and I. Thinking about obtaining success in the Lord. He said this. You can't get to it until you go through it. Both choir songs dealt with going through hardships, but the Lord being there for you. Amen. Joshua says that if we include those three things in our life, then we'll have success and we'll prosper. Again, you can't get to it until you go through it. With God's help, I want to preach for just a few minutes on becoming a successful Christian. So preach, I'm saved. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. I'm glad you're saved. If you're not saved here today, I pray the Lord speaks to your heart and you get so miserable about being a sinner that you desire to be saved and you come and repent and trust the Lord. That's the Lord's will for your life. But if you're saved, your desire ought to be to please the Lord. How can you be a successful Christian? How can God be pleased with you and how can you prosper? Can I say successful Christians keep their eyes on the Lord, they keep their nose in the book, they keep their ear attent to what God has for their life, they walk in the paths that God sets forth for them and all the while God's a blessing them but that's not important to them. What's important to them is Him. So how can we be a successful Christian? Can I say, first of all, God's success is brought through the path of testing. Amen. You'll never become prosperous until you've been tested. If we had time, we'd just flip over a couple chapters and you'll find a man by the name of Caleb. 
Caleb is about ready to go and get a mountain that God had promised him. God promised it to him when he was 40. Now Caleb is going on 85 years old. And Caleb said he's just as strong now as he was when God promised it to him. He said, he said Joshua, give me my mountain. I'm headed that way. Huh? He said, I don't need any help. He said, me and my family's taking the mountain. Huh? Why? God promised it to me. Can I say you uh, what a blessing uh, to know that God brought him to his mountain and he got his mountain and God fulfilled his promises by the way he always does. Uh, 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 what a blessing to see Caleb and Joshua uh, uh, after Caleb uh, in Moses' days uh, was frustrated when they went in and spied out the land and Joshua and Caleb said, hey, there are giants, uh, but God said it's ours. Uh, and then he basically said, if God be for us, who can be? against us uh, and he said let's go get it and the other ten spies gave a bad report and the people got scared they didn't trust in God and they spent 40 years in the wilderness all of them died out except Caleb and Joshua because they believed in God and we read that we say wonderful 40 years what a blessing 40 years is a long time hmm? you didn't have gray hair 40 years ago you didn't have thinning hair 40 years ago Huh? You didn't have 40 years ago. Huh? Hey, I'm with you, bro. Me too. Huh? 40 years ago, I had hair. You know what I'm saying? Huh? But listen, 40 years is a long time. How many times do you think Caleb had to listen to them uncircumcised heart of Jews murmur against God in 40 years? I mean, we just got a few examples in the Bible where Moses said, we're going this way, and they'd start murmuring, and God opened up the earth and swallow them up. Uh, they'd murmur, and God would send, uh, send them to bitter waters, and God would have to chastise them. And how many times do you think Caleb had to listen to people complain about Moses and complain about God? Yeah. Complain about walking around in that wilderness? Even though God supplied them manna in the morning, supplied them quails, so he'd open up rocks and give them rivers to drink from. Even though God met every need, even though their shoes never wore out, even though their clothes never wore out, they still murmured and complained. Some of them said it'd be better we go back to Egypt, be slaves. How many times do you think Caleb in 40 years had to listen to that garbage? How many bodies do you think Caleb helped bury in 40 years? How many graves did he have to help dig? in 40 years. See, well, think about that. Huh? How many times in 40 years when storms came and he didn't have anything put over his head, how many times did he have to face adversity and struggles and trials? See, his faith was tested for 40 years before he, before he obtained prosperity. Can I say? If you're going to be a prosperous and successful Christian, you'll be tested. Hey, your faith wouldn't be worth anything if it wasn't tested. Hmm? If all you ever did was had mountains and rainbows and unicorns, how, how, how good a Christian would you really be? Hmm? One songwriter said, if we never had any, any reason to pray, how would we know that God could answer our prayers? Hmm? Your faith will be tested. There will be a testing period in your life. You'll be tried with fiery trials of your faith, as Peter tells us in chapter 1. Why? So you can become prosperous. So you can know that you've got a God who's going to stand by you. You know that you've got a God who's going to supply. You know that God is well able, huh? See, it's one thing to quote, we know God's exceedingly abundantly able to do that which we ask or think. It's one thing to let that roll off your tongue. It's another thing to live it. Hmm. It's one thing for me to tell somebody that has cancer, God will be with you through it. It was another thing for me to go through it and find out He was with me through it. Hmm. In order to be prosperous and successful, there will be testing. You wonder why sometimes... You, you know God has brought you through things and God's been good to you, but sometimes it seems like you take a step forward and then you take four backwards and it seems like you're just inching along. God's wanting to make you successful. You're being tested. Can I say, 
you may not only have to face the path of testing, you may have to face the path of travail. We have the example of Joseph, who is a perfect type of Christ in the Old Testament. Forty-two times do you find Joseph a picture of Christ, and there's 42 generations from Adam to Jesus. There's so many examples. Joseph, we know, was the beloved of his father Israel, and he made him a coat of many colors, and Joseph was blessed with the, uh, a gift of God to interpret dreams and, and uh, God gave him a dream where he would rule over his brothers uh, and Joseph was a big mouth. He was so excited about that he went and told his brothers never thinking that his brother's feelings might get hurt about that. Amen. If you study the life of Joseph his brothers threw him in a pit took his coat of many colors put some blood on it told his father the beast uh, 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 killed him. Then they sold him into slavery. Then the slave sold him to Potiphar. He's in Potiphar's house, finds favor with Potiphar. Then Potiphar's wife desires to have him. He says, no, that's against the things of God. And that's against my master. And he runs out. He runs out of his coat. She's got his coat. She lies on him. He goes to prison. He's in prison for a long time. Uh, uh, Baker and Butler come down there, finds favor with them. Uh, 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 they say, we get out. We're going to tell Pharaoh. They got out forgot all about him. He's down there until Pharaoh has a dream. Well, I'm saying, hey, I remember a guy down there in jail. He knows how to interpret dreams. They brought him up. He found favor with Pharaoh and then is made a, a, a ruler over all of Egypt. And guess what? His brothers had to come and get food from him. Huh? You say, why are you saying all this? How much travail did that man suffer? Amen. False accusations, had to go to prison, had to go through all kinds of hardship. But never do you find him with a bad attitude. Matter of fact, when his brothers come to him and they're fearful he's going to kill him when he reveals himself and they're fearful of what he's going to say, they're fearful that he's going to chew him out, they begin to apologize. He says, hey, you meant it to me for harm, but God meant it for good. Huh? Sounds pretty successful to me. He didn't have a grudge. He wasn't bitter. He got better, huh? Because through it all, he found the Lord was with him uh, and the Lord strengthened him. Uh, and through the paths that he had to go through and the travail he went through, uh, he found God is good. Uh, and through it all, God blessed him to be successful. Amen. You may have to go through the path of testing. You may have to go through the path of travail. But you may have to go through the path of thorns. The Apostle Paul, we know, had a thorn in the flesh. It was a messenger of Satan to buffet him. Uh, we're talking about the Apostle Paul. And I know us Baptists, uh, we got Baptist popes that put him up on a pestle. Uh, he wrote to half the New Testament. He was the great apostle to the Gentiles. We wouldn't be here today without the Apostle Paul. Amen. Well, oh, we herald how he went to prison and how he went through things. Uh, we think, boy, he was Superman. Boy, a snake bit him. He flung him off in a fire and he showed no harm. They wanted to make a god of him on the Isle of Miletus. Huh? Bless God, I'm telling you, anywhere there's a snake, you're not going to find me if I know he's around. Huh? But here he is, the great apostle that walks on water. Now what amazes me, brother James, Paul had the gift of God to heal people. He could lay hands on people and heal them. But he couldn't heal himself. Had a thorn in the flesh. Hmm. Three times he prayed, God, remove this thorn from my life. The Lord looks at him and says, Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee. And you know, after God told him that, he never prayed for God to remove that thorn again. Now, can I say something about this? Sometimes God puts thorns in our lives and we wall around and we're begging God to remove the thorn. It might be the very thing needed in our life for us to do what God would have us to do. But that thorn was real in Paul's life. You say, how did he do with that? Well, when it all come down to the end, Paul said, I fought a good fight, I kept the faith. He said, henceforth there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Sure. Uh, you say, what happened? Paul was successful. He was prosperous, even facing a thorn. 
You may be here today and there's something that haunts you. There's something that eats at you. There's something that uh, constantly hurts you. It may be a physical ailment. Uh, it may be something that you face uh, uh, that deals with your mind. It may be something that no matter where you go, it goes with you. I've got good news. If God was God enough for Paul, he's God enough for you. And his grace is sufficient. But you may have to have a path of thorns to become successful. Can I say this? Maybe a path of tears. We all know the story of Hannah. I don't understand how Hannah's husband can have two wives. I love my wife. My wife is consumed with my heart. I love her 31 years almost. We've been married. I love her. I can't imagine her having two husbands or me having two wives. Uh, there's only room in our bed for one other person. You know what I'm saying? There's only room in our car for one other. There's only room in the kitchen for one other. Are you, what are you shaking your hand? You want two wives? What are you shaking your head for? Oh, okay. All right. All right. Huh? I'd keep an eye on him there, Miss Veronica. Huh? Huh? All I'm going to say is it must have been a large house to have two women in there. Are you listening? The story goes, one of them bore him children, Hannah couldn't. Amen. Now listen, in Bible days, if a woman couldn't have children, they were looked on upon like they were cursed from God. you gotta sit, You got to understand, women weren't like women today. They weren't allowed to think for themselves. They weren't allowed to be educated. They weren't allowed to have any positions. They were treated as property. Their sole purpose was to have babies. If they couldn't do that, then they were considered useless. Hannah was broken. She loved her husband. She was broken because she couldn't bear any children. And you know the story. She goes to the temple. She is so broken and overwhelmed. The priest thought she was drunk. And all she desired was a child. And she made a vow to God that if God blessed her with a man-child, she'd give him back to God. God blessed her with Samuel. As soon as he was weaned, she took him to the temple and dropped him off. He became the greatest high priest that Israel has ever known. The blessing, the success, and the prosperity came through tears. How many tears have people shed only to see God dry their tears and bless them beyond their comprehension? Your success may be dependent upon the tears that you shed might be a path of tears. The psalmist read, Put thou my tears in a bottle. Are they not in your book? We all have a tear bottle. Some people's tear bottles are empty because they're never broken about anything. And therefore, they're never successful because the Bible says God is nigh them of a broken heart and save us such of a contrite spirit. God resisteth the proud but gives grace to the humble. Can I say, your path may be a path of tears for you to enjoy God's success and God's prosperity. I thought about this. Maybe a path of tenacity. All that Daniel went through, being taken captive by Darius, then being taken captive again by Belshazzar, and then, and, and then uh, all that he was faced with, and uh, every turn he was blessed to be prosperous, and every turn people would uh, be upset with him. They finally made a decree. Nebuchadnezzar, if he doesn't pray to you, he ought to be killed. They made that decree, and what did what Daniel do? He threw up the window like before. He prayed three times a day. Uh, all the tenacity went through, but he still served God, and he was prosperous and blessed by God. Just because somebody says you can't, don't mean that God says you can't. Amen. Mm. Just because they pass laws that say we can't be Christian, don't mean we can't be Christian. And I thought about this lastly. You may have to face the path of trusting. Amen. You know the story of Job? He lost everything he had. Yep. Yes, sir. Lost his finances, lost his flocks. But more importantly, lost his family. He went to ten funerals in one day. He buried ten children in one day. Then his flesh became rotted. 
by say nothing because of what Job had done. Job even offered up sacrifice on behalf of his children in case they'd forgotten to. Amen. Job's ordeal was a deal between God and the devil. The devil was seeking after somebody like me or you, and then God said, Has thou considered my servant Job? God's the one who brought Job up. The devil said, You bless that man too much, he ain't going to deny you. Yep. So God let him strip everything. Even his wife, in her pain of dealing with ten children being buried, and her pain of looking at her husband in pain, said, Job, why don't you just curse God and die? A lot of preachers preach her being arrogant now, the will of God. She's broken. She's hurting. She's tired of suffering. She wants the pain to end. Job said this, Job thirteen fifteen. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. But I will maintain mine own ways before him. In all of Job's affliction, God never spoke to Job. God never gave him a promise. Job was not indwelt in, in by the Holy Ghost of God. Job was just going through it to, to get to it, my dear friends. Uh, and Job said, uh, even if he slays me, I'm going to trust him. Uh, and Job said, uh, 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 until I hear from him, I'm going to maintain my ways. Uh, I'm going to stay the course. Uh, I'm going to stay on the path. Uh, I'm going to still do what I know is right. Uh, Sometimes when you don't even have a promise, you still got to trust God. I've heard that saying, just get the end of the rope, tie a knot, and hold on to. Sometimes you don't have enough rope to tie a knot just to keep holding on. Because the bottom line is, He's holding you anyway. Uh, I said all that to say this. Each one of those examples, with the exception of the Apostle Paul, they didn't have the scriptures and they didn't have the Holy Spirit not indwelling them Amen. we have both and we have the Savior to boot Hebrews wrote it like this the writer of Hebrews said in chapter 11 verse 39 and these having obtained a good report through faith received not the promise they didn't have the promise of the Messiah going to the cross for them. We do. They didn't have the completed word of God. We do. They didn't have the Holy Ghost indwelling them. We do. God having provided some better thing for us. Hmm? That they without us should not be made perfect. Our success and our prosperity in Christ is an indictment to those who do not know Christ. Right. When you on the job, all you do is whine and complain how tough you got it when God's trying to test you uh, or God's putting you through travail. Uh, when all you do is whine before unbelievers, uh, they look at you and say, why should I trust your God? Uh, but oh, uh, when your world falls apart uh, and you can still say, blessed be the name of the Lord, uh, when your world still turns apart uh, and you're faithful to the things of God uh, and God blesses you uh, and God prospers you, uh, it's an indictment on them uh, as to why they too do not put their faith in God listen we all go through difficult circumstances we all face problems Job said man's days are few and full of trouble lost people have problems and so do saved people We'll tell you something there. Sometimes we have obstacles and sometimes circumstances and sometimes things come in our life and we don't go through it to get to the prosperous, successful life God would help us to do. So many people quit before the blessing comes. Whatever plot or lot God has put in your life and whatever path He has put you on, you, my dear friend, are charged with trusting in what he said, living the way he told you to live, and keeping your eyes looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Amen. Keep taking steps towards him. Draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to you. 
Keep walking your path towards Him. No matter the travail, no matter the testing, no matter uh, the thorns, no matter what you're facing, uh, 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 friend, just keep trusting. Uh, keep walking. Uh, keep uh, heading toward Jesus. Uh, you keep walking towards Him. Sooner or later, you're going to bump into Him, uh, and it'll be all right. Uh, and you'll have a prosperous, successful life. Uh, and friend, it won't matter what goes on in this world. Uh, it won't matter what your address was. Uh, it won't matter how much you had in the bank account because you'll have him uh, and friend that's what it's all about uh, some of you have really been hit with some things lately it might just be God trying to get you closer to him and it may be that God's wanting to showcase you to a world what God can do in somebody's life who just sells out and trust in him let me read our text verse again This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. You know why some of you don't have a prosperous life? You say, preacher, are you saying I'm not saved? I'm not saying that at all. But you're not prospering. You're not being successful in your Christianity because you spend too much time looking at your circumstance, looking at your problem, looking at all that you're going through, and you don't spend enough time talking, meditating, and looking to Him to get you through it. You've got to go through it to get to it. Some of you have got to it, and you've sat down on God. Hmm. Some, some of you, all you can talk about is how bad you got it. All you talk about is how poor your health is, how hard it is to do this, how hard it is to do that. Do you think it was easy for Paul? Do you think it was easy for Job? Do you think it was easy for Joseph? Do you think it was easy for Hannah? Can I say, in the, in the early church, it always thrived when it was under persecution. You know why so many folks are not successful and why so many churches are not successful because we've got comfortable in our circumstances and in our complaining God help us to prosper because we have a prosperous Lord who has designed his purpose for us to succeed hmm? nowhere in the book do we find it's okay to just stop and rest for a while in a roadside rest and not do anything for God I got good news for you when we cross over, we'll rest forevermore. But while we're here, whatever path he has designed for you to, to walk in, walk in with your head held up looking towards him, and come what may, go through it, and you'll obtain it. You will become a successful, prosperous Christian for God's glory. And that's what it's all about. I've said it a million times, a hundred years from now, all that's going to matter is what you did for Jesus Christ. Amen. Let me ask you a question. How successful of a Christian are you? How prosperous of a Christian are you? What does God say about you? A minute, we're going to have an invitation. Folks are satisfied where they are. They won't get right with God. How can we ever expect sinners to get right with God when God's people won't get right with Him? Yeah. Amen. How prosperous are you towards heaven? the things of God. Let's all stand, Brother Ray, get a song of invitation. While they're getting a song, let's pray. Father, we love you. Lord, we know that anything that we do, we do it because of your touch and your power and your strength. Lord, we don't lean on our own understanding. Lord, even the great Apostle Paul said, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Lord, it takes you and you alone to propel us through our situations and our circumstances, our obstacles. God, I'm glad your grace is sufficient. I'm glad you're long-suffering and patient towards us. I'm thankful for your mercy. I'm thankful for your strength, your help in time of need. Too many have quit looking for the help. And they've sat down on God. In the midst of their testing, they're wallowing and they're suffering whether than thanking God that he chose for them to suffer for his name's sake. Now God, get glory today. Help your people. Several, I know, Lord, are just struggling. 
they're facing some grave things God help them touch them bless them and God get glory from their lives help us to have prosperous successful godly lives that you'll be pleased with blessing this invitation and God certainly for any amongst us unsaved please convict them of sin that my God we might see them repent and trust Christ have your will and way now in Jesus name we pray Amen Do you struggle to find good Bible based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on bookstore where we have a ton of resources and as always, thanks for listening